All right. Let's get started. Um, uh, we're well into chapter five, and we're going to continue chapter five. But I first want to ask a question. Has anybody been following what's going on this week from Europe? You know what's happening this week in science? Nobel Prizes are being announced this week. I think the, the blue LED, yes. Ah, very good. People are paying attention. Um, actually, in, in science, there are several different Nobel Prizes for various uh, areas of science. Um, physics was announced on Monday. Chemistry was announced yesterday. Uh, medicine, uh, there's one coming up in medicine. Has that been announced yet? I don't recall. But yesterday, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to three people. And so I just wanted to highlight that a little bit. Um, this is a, an interesting prize because chemistry is such a broad field that there are people who do chemistry uh, in one area that actually have a hard time talking to people who are chemists in another area because they're very, very different. Uh, they can range from organic chemistry to analytical techniques to biochemistry, many different areas. But this year, the Nobel Prize was given to these three people, one American, uh, I think one American, right? And uh, the other two. Uh, from outside of America for their contributions to making a blue LED. Um, well, actually, no, sorry, the blue LED was the physics prize. You're messing me up. Uh, these people discovered a technique and created a technique to look at very, very, very small things, particularly molecules. Uh, molecules that are big enough to be able to see within a cell. So the uh, technique they developed is a super fast microscopy, um, which extends the ability, something like an electron microscope would destroy things. You have to kill a cell to be able to use an electron microscope to image it. These people uh, developed a microscope that can be, work in living cells, and so they can actually see biomolecules and image them in living cells and follow them as they actually go throughout life processes. So that's why they won the Nobel Prize has big impacts in medicine, uh, but they developed the physical analytical technique to do that. So I just wanted to share that. Nobel Prize in Chemistry. These prizes coming up sometime soon too, so pay attention. Uh, yes. Tomorrow. <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's uh, let's talk about chemistry because. Everybody who wins a Nobel Prize starts out just like you in a classroom uh, talking about science. So uh, we can continue talking about aromatic compounds. So last time we talked about the fact that there are certain types of compounds that have special stability, which we call aromatic compounds, and we talked about the fact that uh, these benzene rings are embedded in all kinds of different compounds that we call aromatic um, and that special stability leads to different reactivity, and it has to do with having the right combination of structural features. That is, having a pi system or pi bonds that are all conjugated in a ring, so it's in a circle, with the right number of electrons that give rise to a physical property uh, that provides extra stability. Okay, as opposed to just uh, double bonds, which are in a linear chain, they wouldn't have the same kind of stability, or not having the right number of electrons actually would make it somewhat unstable in these particular configurations. Uh, so remember how we recognize aromatic uh, structures and the structures of aromatics. We talked about naming. Hopefully you don't have a problem with naming at this point because we've been doing this all along. And the systematic names, uh, most of the rules are the same when we uh, move on here, we just have more vocabulary to learn. Uh, some of the new names and some of the new parent names uh, that we need to learn to be able to use naming for aromatic compounds and substituted benzenes. Okay? Well, I want to talk about this reaction. Um, we talked about last time the fact that benzene, when exposed to something like bromine, which we know reacts very readily with double bonds, doesn't react at all with a benzene ring. And that's somewhat surprising, and now we know it has to do with the fact that benzene, having that ring structure with the conjugated pi electrons, provides extra stability. So it's not surprising 
that benzene is going to be unreactive towards a lot of electrophiles for breaking the double bonds and breaking the aromaticity. So if you if you react with one of the pi bonds in benzene ring, you've lost that aromatic stability. And you have to go to a high energy intermediate relative to where it is. Uh, so just on the surface, it doesn't react with typical things that we see reactions with other double bonds um, undergoing. So we found that benzene actually does a substitution reaction under the right conditions. If we use a Lewis acid catalyst, in this case, in this example, we're using iron tribromide as a Lewis acid catalyst. And remember, a catalyst is unchanged in the reaction. It participates in the reaction. It helps lower the energy barrier uh, so the reactions can proceed faster or at a lower temperature. Uh, but in the end, you recover them unchanged. Okay, that's a catalyst. So how do you think a Lewis acid catalyst would be, act, be working in this particular reaction? What, what do you think it's doing? Why don't you think about that for a minute? The reaction is not uh, the product to give what we would expect an addition to the double bond, because that would no longer be aromatic. The product we get is a substitution of the hydrogen that was originally in this position with a bromine. Okay. The other product in the reaction being HBr. Okay, so we have a Lewis acid catalyst, we have bromine, and let's think about bromine for a minute. Bromine, Br2 is a bromine bromine bond. We know when that approaches a normal double bond that we get a Br plus come off and then Br minus. So you can think about that as a Br plus Br minus. But in actuality, when we do a reaction with a double bond, it's not that we have generated Br plus in solution. That happens simultaneously. So if you have a double bond coming close, so here's my high bond of a double bond, coming close towards bromine and the electrons are forming a bond or attacking the bromine, then only then in the transition state is the bromine-bromine bond breaking. Okay. It becomes polarized as it gets near to the nucleophilic pi bond of a double bond. All right. So in our alkene chemistry, we've talked about bromine reacts as an electrophile as a Br plus, but there's never Br plus floating around in solution. Um, the difference with benzene is benzene isn't isn't strong enough to do that because we want to keep that aromatic character as much as possible. It's very stable. So in order to get a reaction, we need to make bromine much more reactive. That means ideally you want to generate Br plus alone without the other Br minus attached to it, without that bond between them. That would be more reactive if we actually had Br plus as a cation, right? Well, that's what the Lewis acid is helping us to do. Okay, the Lewis acid, remember, a Lewis acid is looking for electrons. It wants to form a bond uh, to something with electrons. So iron tribromide, in this case, is what's reacting with Br2. So iron tribromide is reacting with Br2 to take the Br- minus off of it, and that generates a bromine cation plus, now, FeBr4. Minus as an anion. So that's all the Lewis acid catalyst is doing. It's actually breaking apart the bromine, so we get now a very reactive electrophile, much more reactive than Br2. So once we have a very reactive electrophile, okay, how do you think that would react with benzene? What's the, react what's the only reactivity or reactive functional group we have in benzene? The double bonds, right? There's electron density in the pi system. Now, just because it's, it's uh, extra stable, because it's an aromatic compound, doesn't mean when it reacts with something that's really reactive, it can't react. And it does. So in this case, I'm going to uh, erase this to make more room here. 
In this case, how the reaction works is uh, the Br plus that's generated from the reaction with iron tribromide does react with the electrons of the pi system. Okay? An intermediate does have a carbocation intermediate. Now, with the aid of this catalyst, and oftentimes we have to heat these reactions quite a bit, we can generate an intermediate where that's broken. So now keep in mind as I draw this structure, there's originally a hydrogen on the carbon that I'm attacking with putting the bromine on. So I'm going to highlight that, hydrogen and bromine, because this intermediate has that carbon sp3 hydrogen. There are four bonds to it. That would leave a plus charge here, and then the other two double bonds. Okay. Uh, now, in this case, what happens next? Uh, well, first of all, let's take a look at this plus charge. Is that the only resonance form you could draw for that plus charge? Are there other forms you could draw? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Notice that that plus charge, all the other atoms in the benzene ring left are sp2 hybridized. They all have p orbitals. So that plus charge is delocalized throughout the rest of the uh, ring. So we can draw that plus charge where these electrons shift over, right, and the plus charge moves. So we can draw this intermediate with the plus charge here. The double bond has moved there. The other double bond stays where it is. Okay, that's another resonance form, even though my, my six-member ring looks a little funny. That's another resonance form. We could do that one more time. These electrons could shift over, and that plus charge could, could uh, switch places with the double bond that's next to it. Okay, so there are actually three resonance forms you can draw. Okay. Three resonance forms you can draw. And all three of those contribute to the ring. And again, notice, um, based on those three resonance structures, where are the electron, where is the plus charge located on the ring? Okay, if I have these here, I could, I could draw it like this, where there's plus charge spread out. But we know that the plus charge is existing on this carbon, on this carbon, and on this carbon of that conjugated system, right? Okay, so the first step in this substitution reaction of benzene is the same as the first step when we add Br2 or HBr or something like that to a double bond. We break the pi bond, we generate a carbocation, and we've added something plus, in this case, Br plus. The only difference between this and our other alkenes we've talked about is that it's harder to do it with benzene because it's more stable. That's why we need a super reactive electrophile. So we need to have ways to generate the Br plus, more reactive. Uh, the other difference is then in the second step. So if we add Br2 to a double bond, we add a Br plus first, and then wherever that carbocation is, we add a Br minus, right? So we have two bromines. That product isn't formed. So obviously the second step now has to be different than a normal alkene reaction. And that's the difference. So instead of losing or adding Br minus, we reform the more stable aromatic ring system by reforming a double bond. In order to do that, we have to take off a proton. And so you notice this hydrogen here on the structure that I've drawn here 
that's on an sp3 carbon, we need to take something off that carbon to get it back to the double bond in sp2 hybridized. So this is where uh, we lose, this is where we lose then the H part to form eventually HBr. That hydrogen comes off because it's protonating a Br minus, and actually if you think about it, it's FeBr4 minus, one of these bromines takes that hydrogen off. So the electrons that are in the carbon hydrogen bond reform the double bond. Okay. And that's what gives rise then to our product that we see. The byproduct is HBr, and then what's left also is FeBr3, the catalyst we started with. And so again, look at the analogies between this mechanism, analogies and differences. Between this mechanism and a mechanism that we just add to a double bond. We add something plus, we generate a carbocation, but because, of it, because that aromatic stability is so great, we want to reform it. So instead of adding the next thing to make a product that completely breaks it, we reform the benzene ring, losing a hydrogen or a proton. Okay. And why would it do that? Well, because to go to the product of substitution versus addition, it's a lower energy pathway. We get to a more stable product. Okay, and that's described. The mechanism is uh, drawn again here for you, along with the energy diagram, which, which illustrates uh, the differences between the two different pathways. So we start with benzene, which is something that's pretty stable with a catalyst which helps us generate a very reactive electrophile. We generate a Br minus, or I'm sorry, Br plus. It adds to the double bond, makes a carbocation intermediate. There are three resonance structures we could draw from that. And instead of adding the Br minus to give the addition product, that's a higher energy pathway from that intermediate. We go back to a more stable aromatic system by taking off the proton instead and letting the electrons reform the double bond. Question? Will the benzene ring always have three resonance structures? When you add, when you add an electrophile to benzene ring, you should always be able to draw three resonance structures. Sometimes with other substituents, as we'll see later, we can actually get more than that. But yeah, definitely within the ring, you can always draw three resonance forms of that charge. Okay, uh, the first step in this reaction is the, uh, the most difficult one. Again, illustrating why we need to have something that's really reactive to be able to add. You need a very, very reactive electrophile. Um, so we generally need heat or catalytic condition, something to generate, something that's very, very reactive. Okay? Okay, so if you can think about this mechanism, we have a way to generate a Br plus, it adds, and then we lose the hydrogen in the end to reform the benzene ring. You can imagine all kinds of things could add to the benzene ring in a similar fashion. Okay, and one of the hallmarks of chemistry of aromatic compounds is there are many different reactions we can to add all kinds of functional groups. As long as we can generate a very reactive electrophile to add first, something that's positively charged and quite reactive. So we can do that not just with bromine, we can add chlorine, do a substitution to put chlorine on the benzene ring. We can do a substitution to put iodine on the benzene ring. Again, you can see the Lewis acid catalysts that are necessary here. Iron trichloride, same thing as iron tribromide. It's doing exactly the same thing. It's taking chlorine and breaking it apart to form Cl plus and FeCl4 minus. Then Cl plus adds, just like the bromine did. Exactly the same mechanism as bromine. Iodine, 
We can use Lewis acids to do iodine. Actually, uh, iron triiodide is not the most stable uh, compound, so iron Lewis acids aren't used, but what's been found is that copper Lewis acids are used and work well to generate I+. Plus. And so that's the difference. Just a, it's just a different Lewis acid. It fulfills the same role as iron does in the above reactions. Okay. Overall, we've done a substitution for a hydrogen. Byproduct is HX in all these cases. All right. Okay, well, we can do other things. Halogens aren't the only thing we can add. We can add um, groups on to do other functionalization. We can make nitrobenzene from benzene very quite readily by reacting nitric acid and sulfuric acid together. What I have over the arrow is the catalyst, uh, essentially a catalyst. Um, or the other reagent. HNO3, you think, well, how does that put on NO2? And let's think about that for a minute. Um, if, I, if I did the substitution reaction, as shown here, of hydrogen for chlorine, hydrogen for bromine, or hydrogen for iodine, what was the electrophilic added in those cases? The Cl plus? a Br plus or an I plus, right? In all these cases, that had to be Cl plus, Br plus, or I plus. Well, let's take a look at this nitration reaction. If I'm going to generate a product which is benzene ring substituted with an NO2 group, what was the electrophile that had to have added to that? If I put on chlorine, I need a Cl plus. If I put it on bromine, I need a Br plus. If I put on NO2, I need NO2 plus. Yeah, it's that easy, that simple. We need NO2 plus. Okay? NO2 plus. The structure of NO2 plus, by the way, looks like this. That's the Lewis structure of NO2 plus. And the nitrogen is electrophile because one of the one of these electrons can flow towards the oxygen and the nitrogen can react as an N plus. So NO2 plus, that's we, we can't just get a bottle of NO2 plus though. We have to generate it. And that's why we combine together nitric acid and sulfuric acid. That makes NO2 plus. So what is the structure of nitric acid, the Lewis structure? What does it look like? Can you draw the Lewis structure of HNO3? It's not a tetrahedron. It's nitrogen with three oxygens. And so it looks like this. There's one oxygen with a double bond. One oxygen with a single bond, and another oxygen with a single bond. This one has to be protonated. So notice there's eight electrons around nitrogen and four bonds. So there's a formal plus charge on the nitrogen, and a formal minus charge on that oxygen. That's the Lewis structure of HNO3. Okay, uh, what, what happens is that sulfuric acid will protonate that, and where do you think you'll put a proton on on this molecule? On the oxygen, there's, there's an O minus there, right? So if you protonate O minus from sulfuric acid, uh, sorry, these are all different sizes. You'll generate this, and overall it's plus charged because the nitrogen has a formal plus charge. And then to generate NO2 from that, NO2 plus, what happens is it eliminates a molecule of water. So I'll just show you here. This 
and this come off, and those electrons go down to form NO2 plus plus H2. So the sulfuric acid is catalyzing the dehydration of nitric acid, the loss of water from nitric acid, to generate now something that's really reactive. NO2 plus is a quite reactive molecule. Okay. So we've generated NO2 plus. Then what's the mechanism for this electrophilic aromatic substitution to put on nitro group? It's exactly the same as the mechanism to put the bromine on, or the chlorine, or iodine. It starts out by first generating the NO2 plus. The NO2 plus will react, will react with the double bond to form the intermediate carbocation. Drawn rather poorly again. The intermediate carbocation, well, which you can draw three residence forms. Uh, but as the first step, we generate this intermediate high energy, and then it reforms the aromatic ring by loss of the hydrogen. So those electrons form. What do you think now is gen is generating is taking that proton back? The water. So water could, yes. Uh, but eventually, what do we have? We, we first gave up the proton from sulfuric acid to nitric acid, right? So eventually, sulfuric acid comes back. But obviously, something. It could be water present eventually, or HSO3 minus eventually gets it. Something in there will grab that proton and reform the double bond. Same mechanism. Just a different electrophile. So. Um, you'll see me later. Anything we're adding to, to for, by this mechanism, I refer to as electrophile, and you might hear me talk about it as an E plus to stand for any electrophile. We can put on sulfonate groups, sulfonic acid. So with uh, sulfur trioxide, SO3, also with sulfuric acid present, we can put on an SO3H group. So this is called a sulfonation reaction. So if, I, if I'm replacing a hydrogen on a benzene ring with SO3H, what's the electrophile I need? SO3H+, SO3H plus, very good, you're getting it. We need SO3H H plus, okay? That's the electrophile, and it forms a bond to sulfur. So it is the sulfur, which is the way the positive charge character is. So I'll ask you again, what do you think the Lewis structure for SO3H plus is? Yeah, it's very similar to the, the nitro. SO3H plus, well SO3, SO3, what does SO3 look like? I could draw it like this. Sulfur can have an expanded oxidation sphere that is down lower on the periodic table. So that's SO3. That's neutral. Note no, because there's a formal plus charge on sulfur and a formal minus charge on the oxygen. Overall, that's neutral. With sulfuric acid, this grabs the hydrogen. And we form HSO3 plus. So that then is the electrophile. It's the sulfur which the plus charge is at, and that is what adds to the benzene ring by the same mechanism. This will react with SO3H plus. It'll form the carbocation intermediate, and then we'll lose 
sorry, I'm not going to draw it all at the moment, will lose an H plus back off to reform the double bond. Okay, look at, the, look at how much our toolbox of reactions is growing. I know you'll love that because it's more you have to remember, right? Uh, but it's powerful. Our, our reaction toolbox is powerful. This is really powerful. As I mentioned before, talking about the alkyne chemistry where we could actually make carbon-carbon bonds, we can do the same thing with <coughs> electrophilic aromatic substitution. <coughs> More than 100 years ago, there were some chemists studying this reaction. Uh, one was named Friedel and one was named Crafts, and so this reaction is named after them. An alkylation reaction because we can add carbon groups. In this case, I've used a generic R to refer to any alkyl group. <coughs> any alkyl group. So if we have an um, alkyl halide, in this case, well, let's just use a specific example. We'll just use methyl bromide or methyl chloride. CH3Cl. <coughs> We can substitute a hydrogen on a benzene ring for a carbon. And if we use methyl chloride, what we end up here is a CH3 group, where R is. Okay. So what do we need? What's the reactive electrophile? This should be really easy now. We add CH3, so the reactive electrophile is CH3 plus. We need CH3+. Plus. Making carbocations is not an easy task. Especially making a methyl carbocation is not an easy task. How do you think it's being generated here? The catalyst. Yeah, what, do you, what kind of catalyst is, what do you think this catalyst is doing? It's binding to CH3. It's not binding to CH3. What's coming off of methyl chloride? Cl minus is coming off. So this is a another example. This is a Lewis acid. It happens to be, there are many, many, many kinds of Lewis acids. We've seen iron trigromide, we've seen copper iodide. Uh, not all of them work with everything you want to add. It turns out Friedel and Crafts discovered this to be really good at taking halogens off of alkyl groups. So aluminum trichloride. We'll take the chlorine from our alkyl chloride to generate our reactive carbocation electrophile plus AlCl4 minus. Eventually, we'll end up with HCl in the end and get back aluminum trichloride. So this also, exact same mechanism. This reacts with the reactive electrophile once it's generated. It makes an intermediate which has a plus charge, delocalized, an intermediate in which we then have to take the hydrogen off, generate HCl, and reform the double bond to get to the product. Okay. Now, um, I have to say the Friedel Crafts alkylation, discovered more than 100 years ago, still used today. There's a lot of uses for the Friedel Crafts alkylation. Um, but there are some limitations. And the limitations of the Friedel Crafts alkylation uh, make it a little bit difficult to put in practice for a, for a large range of different kinds of alkyl groups because it's not all alkyl groups are easy to generate carbocations. <coughs> methyl, we can force it, and but I'll say if we want to add methyl group using this reaction, we have to heat this up a lot. It's a really difficult reaction. Uh, whereas if we wanted to make, uh, let me clean this up a little bit. If, uh, if we wanted to add this, it's difficult, although we can do it. 
Um, if we wanted to make this structure, that's a lot easier to do. Why do you think that would be easier to do? Oh no, we go through the same mechanism. But if CH3, let's say CH3 versus this group, that would be much easier to do. Because, let's take a look at this. The <clears throat> starting material we would need would be something like this. CH3 generates a methyl carbocation, and this would generate That carbocation. <clears throat> What's the difference? More substituted. more substituted. It's easier to generate the more substituted carbocation than methyl. You don't have to heat this one up as high. It'll react easier. So there are some limitations. Carbocations are also high energy intermediates. Um, and depending on the stability, they're either easier or harder. And something we haven't really talked about, uh, carbocations actually, if you have them generated on the end of a chain, they actually rearrange and form a mixture of carbocations, um, which complicates things. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways, this was a, actually Friedel and Crafts discovered quite a bit of difficulties in, in making a broad scope of different uh, structures using this. So they thought, well, what can we use that will be more controlled, easier to generate, and make a carbocation that stays just on one carbon? And it turned out uh, that, I'll come back to this, it turned out that <coughs> the Friedel-Crafts acylation reaction works better and is uh, more useful. Uh, the difference being, instead of just taking a chlorine off of a, a sp3 carbon, we take it off to to uh, generate a carbocation next to a on a CO double bond carbon. So in this case, these carbocations are more stable, easier to generate, and don't have a lot of the problems associated with carbocations rearranging. So obviously if we're adding this group, right, the electrophile we need would be the plus charge of that where that bond formed. We need the plus charge on the carbon where the bond formed. That would be this structure. Now this structure, it's a little more stable than an alkyl carbocation because we can actually draw a resonance form which looks like that. <clears throat> so that's why these acyl groups work the same. But it, it's useful because not only, not only are we making a carbon-carbon bond and building up carbon structures, we're making a carbon-carbon bond that adds also a functional group which we could do other things with potentially. We have a CO double bond in the product that we can use to do other chemistry reactions. More reactions in a later chapter coming. Uh, but there are a lot of things we can do with a CO double bond. So it's nice to be able to not only make the carbon carbon bond, but introduce functionality that we could have uh, more tools to do things with. Okay. Again, the actual mechanism for how it adds and substitutes the hydrogen on the benzene ring is identical to all the other examples we've shown. <clears throat> this electrophile that adds <clears throat> reacts with the benzene ring to form the carbocation intermediate and then we lose the hydrogen to reform the double bond. So all these reactions are great. Uh, friedel crafts alkylation and acylations have a few other limitations which I'll just mention. Um, for the <clears throat> alkylation reaction, it only works with sp3, those sp3 carbon halogens. And we can't do it, for example, 
We can't pull off a halogen from a benzene ring and add a benzene ring to a benzene ring. That doesn't work. Um, we can't take a, just a simple double bond, what we would refer to as like a vinyl halide or vinyl chloride, and get that sp2 carbon. The only one sp2 carbons we can add are the acyl groups. Aromatic rings that have already on it electron withdrawing groups. So instead of benzene, we have other groups which are electron withdrawing groups. I'll just use Y to signify something generic. Such as these, we're going to talk about these in depth. But they, Friedel Crafts alkylation doesn't work with benzene rings with these groups on them. And if you have groups like NH2, actually, what happens in this case is that the lone pair on nitrogen reacts with the carbocation before the benzene ring does. So it actually does different reactions. So that's also a complication, just for your information. Okay, so there are some, there are some difficulties with that. Uh, but for our purposes, we, we have now a handle to be able to put on an alkyl group. We can put on an acyl group. We can put on all of these groups now. Here's our, here's our aromatic, electrophilic aromatic substitution toolbox, if you will, or EAS, electrophilic aromatic substitution. Bromine, chlorine, iodine, nitro, uh, a sulfonate group, alkyl groups, acyl groups. We know how to put those all on now, all by the same mechanism, all needing something or some way to generate our, our reactive electrophiles, which are actually undergoing the reaction. Okay, so nitrobenzene you can make. There are some things that we can't make directly by electrophilic aromatic substitution. We have a hard time putting on an OH group. And if you think about it, how in the world would you generate OH plus? Okay, there are no good ways to make OH plus. There are no good ways to make NH2 plus. Okay, so making amino benzene or hydroxybenzene directly, not possible by this way. We have other ways to take functional groups um, that we have made and replace them so we can access those. For example, nitro groups. There are ways to take NO2 and reduce it down and add hydrogen to make NH2 groups. There are ways to do substitutions of halogens and generate OH groups. Uh, but we're not going to go into that detail here. Uh, but just to let you know, there are ways around some of the uh, functional groups that we can't get directly, based on functional groups we can put on. Okay, so that's that's quite a nice toolbox. Um, and that's all fine and great if you just want to substitute benzene. But as we know, there are many, many kinds of aromatic compounds with all ready substituted groups on the benzene ring. So we have to ask ourselves, well, that complicates things a lot. How do we control it? Because if you think about having a group on there already, in this case, I've just used a generic Y to symbolize any group, and adding an electrophile, any of those electrophiles that we just talked about from our toolbox, okay, do they react? How does Y affect? The reactivity, because what we need is the electrons in the ring to be able to react with the group we're adding, right? So how does Y influence the reactivity of the electrons in the ring? That's an important question. Okay. Then the other question is, well, if we already have one group on there, now there are three possible isomeric products. Right? We can get the 1, 2 product, or the other word for that we use, ortho, the 1, 1, 3 product, meta, or the 1, 4 product, para. Okay. What controls the selectivity, or do you get all of them? 
and why? And where and how? These are great questions, right? So we that one of the reasons why I was going through the mechanism very carefully and reiterating it to you is because that understanding the step-by-step -step mechanism and the resonance forms involved there help us understand why and what controls selectivity. Because we see various things. When we think about the reactivity of the reef, okay? So again, when we're doing these reactions, we're using the electron density in the ring because the electron density in the ring, and I'll just look at benzene here, the electrons from the ring have to attack the electrophile, right? So those electrons have to flow towards the electrophile. <clears throat> so if the group you have on the ring is an electron donating group, it's going to push electron density towards the ring. The more electron density, the more it can attack. If you have electron withdrawing groups on the ring, more electronegative groups, or things that pull the electron density out of the ring, then there's less electron density in the ring to do the attack. So look at this reactivity chart here. The, I've just shown four compounds, and if you were to compare the exact same substitution reaction with all four of these, you see differences in the reaction rates, which reflects the reactivity. Right? So relative to benzene, which on this scale of relative reactivity is set to 1, <coughs> chlorobenzene reacts a lot slower. The reaction rate, or the reactivity, is only about 3% of what it is for benzene. Okay. Put a nitro group on there, then the reactivity of the ring drops down 10 to the 8th, or minus 8. So much, much, much less reactive than benzene. All right. Compare that to something like a phenol. If you have an OH group on there, that's a thousand times more reactive than benzene. Okay, and the difference between the molecule left of benzene on this scale and the molecules to the right is that this is an electron donating group, so electron density from the oxygen, in particular actually the lone pairs, are pushing towards the ring. Okay, they're, they're making the ring more electron rich. If it's more electron rich, it can attack your electrophile better. A lot of groups do that. Alkyl groups are electron donating through the single bond. They're inductively donating. Oxygens, nitrogen, sulfurs are electron donating through their lone pairs. So these are what we would refer to as activating groups. <clears throat> Anything that makes the, makes the molecule more reactive than benzene, we say it activates. And if it makes it less reactive than benzene, it's deactivating. So these are electron donating groups. <clears throat> Deactivating groups, halogens, as you see above, has a chlorine, for example, is deactivated, so it's less reactive than benzene. Nitro group, a lot less reactive than benzene. Um, acyl groups, sulfonic acid groups, nitriles, this is a, this is a carbon triple bond nitrogen. <clears throat> Those tend to be <clears throat> electron withdrawing, either inductively or through resonance and deactivate the ring. Okay, so there are essentially two classes, activators, electron donating, deactivators, electron withdrawing. Okay, what about then, uh, we know something about reactivity. That's that first question we asked about substituent effects. How about selectivity for a position? I guess I forgot about this slide. This shows you a little bit about the electron density to show you pictorially. Donating group, notice the ring has a lot of electron density. It's more red. And then as you go to withdrawing groups, there's less red electron density in the ring. OK, that also, those groups do affect selectivity. So let's take a look at these two examples. <coughs> These are two substituted benzenes in which we're doing a nitration reaction. 
We're adding NO2 plus to them. So if we do the reaction with phenol, that is with an OH group, okay, we see essentially two products and about equal mixture. Of the three possible isomers, we see 50% of the ortho substitution, the 1, 2, and 50% of the 1, 4 substitution. And we see none of the 1, 3 substitution, the meta product. Okay, so this greatly prefers putting either ortho or para and does not form the meta. So it does have some selectivity, right? We don't get all three equally. Well, if we put on an electron withdrawing group, like a nitrile group, a CN triple bond, do the same reaction, we see 81% yield of the meta product and only a little bit, there's a little bit formed, but they're in small amounts, 70% ortho and 2% para. So greatly favors one position, which the top one didn't. We got none of that in the top one. We get the meta product. Interesting, huh? So the selectivity on which products you form of the isomers that are possible obviously have something to do with the nature of the group that's on there. It helps direct groups one place or the other. And there's a general trend we see. And if you look at this uh, scale of reactivity, we can also see that that reactivity mostly correlates as well with the preferred positions. So here's a scale of reactivity um, from uh, things we've seen like nitro, nitrile, SO3H, all these electron withdrawing groups or deactivators. The deactivators, the things that are less reactive than benzene and strongly less reactive, favor addition to form the meta product. So we call them meta directors or meta directing groups. On the other hand, if they're electron donating, OH group, alkyl group, nitrogen groups, they're all more reactive than benzene. They're activators for this reaction. They, they favor putting groups in the ortho and para positions. Okay, so we call them ortho para directors. Now, the only outliers in this that don't directly correlate, and it's because their reactivity is actually in the middle and they have some other properties, are the halogens. While they're slightly less reactive than benzene, halogens do direct ortho and para for some reasons, which uh, I'll explain in a minute. <clears throat> okay, so we, we see this trend, we see this correlation. Now let's think about why the nature of that substituent affects the preferred positions. Okay? So when we, anytime we have a reaction with multiple products, the question is which of the, you, you always favor more of the products that have a lower energy pathway, right? So we need to think about of all the competing processes and positions that things could add, where, why, um, which ones are the lower energy pathways? And how does electron donating or electron withdrawing affect that? <clears throat> so we're talking about forming carbocation intermediates, right, in this reaction. So one thing to think about, if you're generating a positively charged intermediate and you have an electron withdrawing group, that's going to make it worse. If you're generating a positively charged intermediate and you have an electron donating group, that's going to be better, more stable, right? Because you're trying to neutralize that charge. And in the resonance forms on those carbons, remember, we don't put plus charge on every carbon. We put a plus charge on every other carbon. So there's only three carbons in that uh, system that would have the plus charge in any of the resonance forms, depending on where we add groups. So let's take a look at this a little more carefully. 
I realize this is a little bit of a busy slide, uh, but I'll try to go through this um, slowly so you can see what's going on. <clears throat> so in the case of electron donating groups, like what we have with an OH, the OH group does impact the stability of the intermediate, which makes it a lower energy pathway. So if you think about adding an electrophile to phenol here, uh, we get the ortho, ortho, and the para product, but none of the meta. Okay, and this is the reason why. If you if you if you look at all the intermediates that are present for any of those positions that you attack with the uh, electrophile, you can see that there are some things that are good about adding either ortho or para. And, and not present when we add that group meta because of the way the plus charge alternates around those resonance forms. So let's take a look at the addition of the electrophile that's adjacent or ortho to the OH group. So if we react the electron density here, right, we get this intermediate, this first intermediate, where the E is added to the carbon ortho to the OH, right? And so what we have is we have plus charge on that carbon. And if we move that plus charge around the ring by drawing the different resonance forms, right, we then can have plus charge on that carbon and a plus charge on this carbon. Those are the three resonance forms of the plus charge being delocalized throughout the ring. Okay? Notice in that last resonance form I drew, the plus charge is on the carbon that the electron donating group is on. So if you get that plus charge close to the electron donating group, that's the best situation. Because then you can help to neutralize that by donating electrons towards the plus charge. And in fact, what an OH does is it, it helps donate by allowing another resonance form with one of its lone pairs. So we could actually draw a fourth resonance form over here. So that way it's become stable. It's, it's a good stable intermediate relative to adding meta. If we add meta, like in the bottom case here, we put the plus charge on this carbon, plus charge on this carbon, and a plus charge on this carbon in the three resonance forms. In none of those can the oxygen lone pairs directly participate, right? So none of them are especially stabilized because of the oxygen donation. Question? So um, the most stable state is always going to be for the double bond is with that OH and then positive. Yeah, if we, we put the positive charge on the carbon that the donating group is on, that's the most stable. Whether it's OH or any other donating group, if the plus charge skips the carbon that the electron donating group is on, it's not as good. It's not as stable. Now notice, if we add ortho versus meta, the plus charges are on different carbons in the resonance forms. But then if we go to the para, the plus charges end up on the exact same carbons as it does with ortho. That's why we saw ortho pair being produced in about equal amounts, but not the meta. Because this one also has a resonance form, particularly here, which is especially stable for the three positions. And allows us, in this case, to draw that fourth resonance form where the oxygen can directly donate. Okay? So of the three possible products, these two, addition ortho and addition para, are lower energy than addition meta. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Well, think about this then. Um, donating groups make that better, so we get ortho para selectivity. If it's an electron withdrawing group, instead of OH, we have something that's electron withdrawing. You don't want to put a plus charge next to an electron withdrawing group 
That would be especially bad or especially unstable. And so what we see is when we go from, we switch from donating group to withdrawing group, the relative energy pathways flip. Meta becomes the lower energy pathway. Ortho and para is higher. So that's on the next slide. It's, a, it's the same busy slide, except instead of an OH group, I'm showing a nitro group. Nitro group is electron withdrawing. And that's because we've put plus charge. Uh, the ortho para is higher in energy because we put the plus charge right next to the electron withdrawing group. So that's electron deficient and electron deficient next to each other. That's not helping each other, that's making it worse. So these are particularly unstable or higher energy. Um, the meta position avoids that. Now it doesn't become particularly stabilized, but it's not particularly unstabilized either. So of the three possibilities here, ortho and para are higher energy, and thus there's less form to them. Okay, for the exact same reason, except we switch from donating now to Okay, um, and so we, we see this similar effect. Now this, this uh, is a scale of reactivity, you know, different groups have more or less donating or withdrawing ability, and so there's more or less influence on that. So in, in actuality, you do see slight differences. Like you might, see a little, you might see a little bit of meta if your donating group is not quite as strongly donating as OH. Um, or, if it's not as strongly withdrawing as nitro, you might get a slightly different. But overall, in general, <clears throat> withdrawing groups will be meta directors, and donating groups will be ortho para directors, for the reason of how they stabilize or destabilize the carbocation. Okay. Um, so this chart, um, you can see we have. A lot of different donating groups, a lot of different withdrawing groups. They give ortho para directing or meta directing, but that one group of, com of substituents, the halogens, how do we explain that? Now they are, they are electronegative, and that's why they're electron withdrawing. So they actually are decreasing the reactivity of the benzene ring a little bit. But the difference with halogens and the other withdrawing groups is that halogens have lone pairs. So it actually does provide some resonance stabilization similar to the OH group. It's just not really strong, but it's there. And so for the uh, ability to direct the positions of the things we're adding, it does the influence then because the lone pair can help to stabilize the plus charge. It also prefers ortho para addition. That's the reason. Although it's slightly withdrawing because of its electronegative nature. Uh, but notice it's very similar to benzene. It's not that far from reactivity with benzene. So it's just slightly electron withdrawing, but ortho para direct. Okay, so there's two effects in don electron donation and electron withdrawing, inductive through the single bond and resonance stabilization or resonance donation through the pi bonds. Okay, uh, let's see. So here's a summary uh, to try to uh, <clears throat> summarize this and put it together. Anything that has a plus charge on it, like if you think about the um, Lewis structure for a nitro group, NO2 group actually has a formal plus charge on the nitrogen. Obviously, you can see putting plus charge next to plus charge would be bad, right? So hopefully you can see why that would be an electron withdrawing group if we put a plus charge there. Um, anything that has a double bond to a more electronegative atom, like a, a CO group, right? If you think about a carbon-oxygen double bond. Oxygen is more electronegative, so 
anything in this pi bond would be polarized towards the oxygen. So the carbon is partially positive. That's why it's an electron withdrawing group. Same thing with the SO3 group or the CN group. Um, the atom attached to the benzene ring is less electronegative than the atoms that have the multiple bonds to them. And so they're all polarized away from those groups. So those are all electron withdrawing. They'll be meta directors and less reactive than benzene, deactivated. These are all electron donating groups. Alkyl is an inductive donating group. All of these have lone pairs that strongly donate and make benzene more reactive. And because of that electron donation, it makes ortho para better, so they're ortho para directors. Halogens are slightly weaker than benzene in terms of reactivity, but still react ortho para. So that's the summary of what those different kinds of groups do for the reactivity and selectivity in the benzene ring. So imagine now, this could get a lot more complicated. What if you had two groups on benzene and you did a third substitution? Then you've got a whole bunch of competing things. Which one of those groups is stronger? Which, which dominates? Are they working together in a position or fighting each other in terms of positions? Uh, there are a lot of things that we think about when we think about how best to put all those things together. I'm going to stop there today, uh, let you think about this over the weekend, um, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll refresh this and talk about this again on Tuesday. But have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.